morning, everyone, and welcome to South Church, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Unitarian Universalist Church. We're delighted to have you with us this morning. Each Sunday, though we are doing virtual services, we know that we see you, we know that you're out there, and we want you to know that you're not alone, that we love to hear from you, that we're thinking of you, and that we're staying connected in any way that we possibly can. One of the ways that makes the worship so very meaningful is that we have many people who contribute. We have guest speakers, and we have worship associates, and we have music. And so you are welcome. I am so glad that you are here with us. And I will invite Myra Aronson, our worship associate, to introduce the rest of the players. And if you hear any noise in the background, it means that the Court Street offices are getting heating, and we're very happy for that. So excuse the background noise. Myra. <laughs> Heat is a good thing. Good morning. I am pleased to be with you in cyberspace this morning in my role as one of eight worship associates who work with our interim minister, Reverend Susan, our director of Lifespan Ministries, Kirsten Hunter, our musicians and staff to create worship services each week. The story today will be brought to you by our RE leaders. And this week, our music will be provided by Joanne Connolly, our director of music. Um, Joanne, can you tell us something about today's music? Yes, Myra, <clears throat> thank you. After talking with Jim, Susan and I came up with some hymns and music about finding peace on this unexpected and difficult upside down journey. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you attend services regularly, welcome, and if you are tuning in for the first time, a very special welcome to you. After the service, there will be a virtual coffee hour. Provide your own coffee. And the link for that is in the email you received last night or this morning and on the Members and Friends Facebook page. Reverend Susan is generally in the pulpit twice a month, and on other Sundays, we will hear from Kirsten or from guest speakers from within and outside the congregation. This morning, I am pleased to welcome to the virtual pulpit, Jim Monroe. I met Jim two years ago in a small group ministry circle, and based on my experience of him as a genuine, attentive, and accessible human being, I speculated that he'd come up with a message that we could all relate to. I think you'll find that's true. And Jim will tell you more about himself when he speaks. Good morning, Jim. Good morning. I'm looking forward to meeting everyone everybody and sharing more of the story later on. Thank you. Um, Kirsten will be doing our tech magic for today's service, but the person who has made it all possible for us to even know how to do all of this is of course the wonderful Pip Clues. And now for today's announcements. Our small group ministry program is thrilled at the terrific response to our fall season. We now have six groups starting up with only a few places left. If you're interested in being part of a small group, now or in January when additional spaces become available, please contact Rita Weathersby at rita.weathersby at unh.edu. The fellowship associates continue to host a Zoom fellowship hour every Friday from 5 to 6 p.m. You're invited to join for an informal conversation and sharing. Information is posted on the South Church website as well as our Facebook page. Newly reinvented version of Circle Suppers, Harvest Gatherings are brought to you by the Fellowship Associates. Instead of indoor dinner prepared by the host, Harvest Gatherings will be held outside midday. We do ask that guests bring their own bag lunch and drinks. So join us for a safe, socially distant, fun, face-to-face, -face, but with masks, event. Go to the South Church Facebook page for information and to find the Sign Up Genius to sign up. And finally, are you ready for the 32nd Annual Pocket Garden Tour? We had such a great time planning, celebrating, and raising $15,000 for South Church that we're already back at it. Sites next year will be in the South End neighborhood. And if you're out walking, peeking over fences, or know someone with a nice garden in that area, please let us know. We have our scouting committee ready to go and we'll pass information on to them. Please contact us at pgt 
at southchurch-uu.org. The peace of the rolling waves to you. The peace of the flowing air to you. The peace of the shining stars to you. The peace of the quiet earth to you. The peace of the rolling waves to you. The peace of the flowing air to you. The peace of the shining stars to you. The peace of the quiet earth to you. About 12 or 15 years ago, my congregation in New Jersey got involved in what was then a new program, Covenant Circles. As described by our minister at the time, Covenant Circles provided an opportunity and a safe place for congregants to explore within small groups both intimacy and ultimacy. That is, to share their concerns and perspectives on both the big questions and the small challenges of daily life and relationships. To look at the issues we regularly deal with in a bigger frame while exploring how the big questions manifest themselves in our daily lives. In this congregation, we know this program as small group ministry. I've found participating in these groups to be an incredibly meaningful and powerful experience. The magic, for it is magic, is in the deep listening. And the challenge is in that too. Part of the covenant among members of the group is that people take turns speaking and no one else is to interrupt, question, give advice, or in any way do anything but listen attentively. It is not easy. Most of us are conditioned when listening to another to be thinking about how we're going to respond. What solace can we offer? What congratulations? What advice? What reaction? What correction? And what question is burning a hole in our brain while we listen? But in these small groups, nothing. You just listen and nod. In our culture, it is very rare that we have an opportunity to speak without being interrupted. It's weird to get used to. 
and it's liberating. Liberating for the speaker who can speak without worry about being criticized or questioned, and it's liberating for the listener. The listening part was hard for me at first. As a school counselor, I guess you could say I was a professional listener, but in that role, I was supposed to respond. Just listening is something else completely. I ultimately came to find it relaxing just to listen, to witness, to accept. It became easy to do in the group. I still struggle with it at home though. I must constantly remind myself not to interrupt, not to cut someone off, not to give unsolicited advice. I fail at it as much or more than I succeed. Last week, Kirsten and Jen told us a story about listening with our hearts. To do that is a beautiful gift to the person speaking. And I believe that by listening better to others, we also become better at listening to ourselves. While I truly listen to another, there is space for me to also be aware of my own reaction to what they're saying. I can better hear my own internal voice. The gift from that is what I learn about myself. So I am trying when I remember to listen with my heart and listen to my heart. As we light our chalice, I invite you to light your own chalice at home. We light our chalices this morning with these words from the Reverend Eric Walker Wickstrom. Here today, in this place, and with these people, may we listen so that we can hear. May we hear so that we can feel. May we feel so that we can know. And may we know so that we can change ourselves and this world. May this chalice we light, light our way. And now please join me in the recitation of our mission statement, which is displayed on your screen. At South Church, we nurture spiritual growth through worship, learning, and community. We celebrate the worth and dignity of all people, and we inspire one another to act on our faith in the larger community. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kirsten, and this is Jen, and we're here to share another story with you today. This, this story is titled, Blink the Wish Fairy. Once upon a time, there was a wish fairy named Blink. A wish fairy is a really special being, but maybe not in the way you might think. A wish fairy doesn't have any special powers to grant wishes and they aren't able to make a wish come true. Still, they're really special because wish fairies listen to our wishes. They listen when we're struggling to find the energy to start the day. They listen when we're filled with happiness about something that's happened. Wish fairies listen to our joys and our concerns, our hopes and our dreams. And that might not seem like a big deal, but having someone in our life to listen to us is surprisingly important. Well, Blink had been a wish fairy for a very long time. They'd always loved being a wish fairy and they were very good at being a wish fairy until one day Blink woke up and they found themselves overwhelmed with a cacophony of noise. There were loud voices and quiet voices and laughter and crying and yelling and growling and braying and howling and cackling and clucking and quacking. And every noise you can imagine any being making. Somehow, all the wishes, all the thoughts of all the beings on earth had blended into one terrible jumble in Blink's ears. And they couldn't sort them out. They couldn't quiet one in order to listen to another. Who 
Ooh, it was terrible. They shook their fairy head, but it didn't help. And they blocked their pointy fairy ears, but it didn't help. It was as if all of the thoughts of the world, all the joys and concerns and hopes and dreams and hurts had all become too much. And they just overflowed into one another into an impossible soup of sound. And Blink didn't know what to do. At first, they really panicked, flying from one place to the next, trying to get away from the noise to turn it all off. And then they started to cry. Mostly, they felt afraid it would never stop, and that brought them to tears. Well, the tears made the, the, the tears in their eyes made the world around them look sparkly. And that gave them an idea. Blink started to fly straight up into the sky. They flew past the tops of the tallest trees and they kept flying past clouds and birds and airplanes and they kept flying. They flew all the way up until they had left the last layer of the earth's atmosphere to where the stars sparkled. And as soon as they broke through into space, finally, all the noise stopped. And the noise stopped so much that the silence felt huge in Blink's ears. It was so different from all the noise that had been going on. And then there was a great peace and Blink soon drifted to sleep. Ah, the magic of a good quiet nap. At some point, a new sound gently stirred Blink from their slumber. It was a small and pleasant sound, a familiar sound from long ago. It was like sweet music. And it was Blink's own heart, and its message was clear. Return here when you need to. Blink felt calm and refreshed and ready to return home. As Blink once again entered the Earth's atmosphere, they started to hear other sounds. First, the sound of the breeze high in the sky, and it was a pleasant sound. Then, as Blink flew below the clouds, there were a few birds, and Blink could tell that the birds were happy. As Blink reached the ground, there was a chipmunk scolding a cat and the sound of traffic on a nearby street. These sounds were not so pleasant, but Blink was able to hear them without feeling upset like before. They were finally able to just be in the world again without feeling overwhelmed by all that was going on. And Blink was ready to listen deeply again to wishes. And it gave them so much joy because Blink was restored their heart was clear and they felt renewed gratitude to be a wish fairy. Now, when the noise of the world is too much, Blink knows to return to that quiet place where they can rest and hear their heart again. And they come back ready to do their best work. I wonder, what are your wishes for Blink to hear? I wonder if the world ever feels a bit too noisy for you. Everyone sometimes needs to find a quiet time or place to rest and find our heart voices again. It might be in a forest or under a soft blanket on a sofa or in a room hearing music through headphones. Where do you go to find peace? and be ready to listen again. Maybe you can tell us with words or a photo, and we can share that with all of our South Church friends during worship later this month. Send me your answers, either with just words or in a picture. How do you return to being ready to listen? Email me at jendeldeo, J-E-N-D-E-L-D-E-O, at southchurch-uu.org. 
We look forward to hearing from you. We miss you. We'll see you soon. It is now time for our morning offering so that we can continue to do our important work within our congregation and in the larger community. Along those lines, our shared plate recipient this month is Seacoast Outright, an organization which advocates for and supports LGBTQ plus youth in the Seacoast area. They provide space and freedom for youth to explore issues related to sexual orientation and gender identity with conversations facilitated by trained and experienced adults. They also provide support for parents and caregivers. And as you have heard from a member of our ABC team, within our own congregation, whether we meet in our building or not, we still need to maintain that building and pay our hardworking staff who continue to do the work required to support us and help fulfill our spiritual needs. May our efforts help this be so. You can give via the donate link on our website or send a check in the mail to our office at 73 Court Street in Portsmouth. Details are on your screen. So let us be in a few moments of silent reflection. I'm reminded this morning of some writing that a friend of mine did, a question that he once asked. This is Reverend Patrick Thomas Aquinas O'Neill. Asked the question, are you a fall person or a spring person? And I love the images that he brought into it and made me think of it this morning as I sit here in the Court Street office and have the bright blue sun of the fall and the crisp leaves falling around me and look out the window and see the chrysanthemums coming to bloom and everything else just kind of fading away. And he reminded me in that writing 
are you a fall person or a spring person, that neither one is better than another, but each have a different perspective on how we view the world. I think I'm a spring person, though I love the beauty of the fall. But there's nothing more pleasant to me than seeing that lime green and smelling the earth that's just newly been harvested. To see the new growth and the new possibilities. But then I think of the fall and I think of the wonderful smell of the leaves as they crunch underfoot. And I think of the smell of the earth as the last harvest is taken from it. I think of the time of being able to lie fallow and to take in the sun and take in the air and just be still. So though I am a spring person, I do appreciate so very, very much about the fall. I don't know what you are, a spring person or a fall person, but I know that you're our person. You are held in love and care and concern by every single person here, your staff and everyone who knows that we are struggling through these very challenging times. Love is sent to you. Peace of mind, peace of heart. Take a moment and tell us your concerns. We do hear, we do care, we do listen. Enjoy whatever season it is that you resonate with and be grateful and know that we're here for you. May it be so. Good morning. My name is Jim Monroe, and I feel like I should introduce myself before I get started. Because to be honest, I haven't had all that much chance to meet all that many South Church folks, and I really wish I had. My wife Pam and I started attending church several years ago at Christmas time. We loved it right away, but held off committing to becoming members for a bit. When I finally decided that I wanted to sign the book, it was literally just a couple of days later that we found out we were without ministers. So that idea got put on hold for a bit. In the meantime, Pam and I both signed up for small group ministry and met some really great people, which convinced me that I really wanted to be a member. So last summer, while we still had an interim minister, Pam and I made a couple of appointments with Jen's help and finally became members. We started attending more regularly in the fall and we're bringing our granddaughter Lily with us most weeks because she just loves to go to nursery and spending time with Barney and the other great volunteers. By last winter, I was ready to really jump in and get involved. I volunteered for the pocket garden tour the Fellowship Associates, to host a circle supper, and I even stepped way out of my comfort zone and offered to play my tin whistle during the Celtic Music Sunday service. You may recall, that was the first of our remote services. If I was a paranoid person, I might begin to think that the universe was trying to tell me that I shouldn't get involved. 
So anyway, Pam and I live in Dover with our two dogs. Before coming to the Seacoast, we were members of the North Parish in North Andover, Massachusetts for many years. We missed it. We missed our friends there. And I'm really glad we found this community and are making new friends. The late UU minister, the Reverend Wayne Shetty, told me once that whenever you craft a sermon or an entire worship service, that it's important to remember that there is at least one person in attendance that day who has come because he or she is in need of comfort. If you are that person, I sincerely hope that something I say today gives you that comfort. I've been told in my life that I'm a control freak. That is absolutely not true. I'm a control enthusiast. Yes, it's true that I've been known to rearrange the dishes in the dishwasher, and I do have a tendency to, to suggest the best way for my wife to make cookies, or how much ice is needed in a cook cocktail glass, but that's just me trying to be helpful. I do think that the fact that we are born with a limited amount of patience, and if you use it up, you can't get more from Amazon. Not yet, anyway. Interestingly enough, there have always been some things in life that I knew were completely out of my control snowstorms, delayed flights, crazy family members, or even construction season on Route 95. Those are all things that I could just be still, let go, and just roll with whatever punches life threw at me. But here we are. It's October of 2020. John Lennon said it best when he sang, Nobody told me there'd be days like these. Strange days indeed. The former Beatle had a talent for understatement. These have been truly strange days. It was a struggle for me to accept that I really could not control the world right now. It was a process of personal growth for me. I've learned to accept that 2020 is like a 12-month blizzard. And when it finally stops, we're all going to come out and make snow angels. It's been a challenge for sure, but I hope my journey will ring true for you, and maybe I can share how I made it through. During the last year, I suspect most of us have experienced every conceivable human emotion. We've experienced frustrations, anger, despair, loneliness, isolation, helplessness, disappointments, and we've probably all dealt with a certain amount of depression before ultimately arriving at a stage of acceptance. I've been through all of these and more. Most of us probably thought life would be back to a complete sense of normalcy by the end of June. We were planning to go out to eat, rescheduling vacations and family events. Surely we'd be able to send our kids and grandchildren back to school by September. Guess what? They say God laughs when we make plans. Truer words have never been spoken, and I imagine God is probably getting a good chuckle at our expense. We're in the midst of a worldwide pandemic that no one alive has ever experienced. Add to that, in our country, we are experiencing a deep sense of division. No matter where you stand on the political issues, we are experiencing a, a divisiveness unseen since Lincoln was president. Very, very few people had any professional training on how to deal with this. For those like our professional staff here at South Church, Jen, Kirsten Hunter, Jen Del Deo, Joanne, Susan Adams and the Reverend Susan, and the volunteers that have held us all together and made this work, 
I just can't say enough what an incredible job that you've done so far. It's so much more than you signed up for. You're in my thoughts. And if you are a teacher or a parent trying to work from home and be a teacher at the same time, I salute you too. You've worked so very hard trying to get it right. I wouldn't switch places with you for any amount of money. In his poem, The Peace of All Things, my favorite poet, essayist, and farmer, Wendell Berry, writes, When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds, and I come into the peace of wild things, who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. I don't have the luxury of sleeping outdoors to listen to the sound of wild things. I wish I did, but in downtown Dover, it's far more likely that I might encounter a hungry raccoon or a skunk than a wild drake. I have, however, discovered and rediscovered ways to appreciate the world, my fellow humans, and ultimately to hear the message that I really have no control over what happens around me. I would never try to tell you how to deal with any of this, but I will share those moments that have made me feel best. Own your feelings and emotions. I discovered early on in last spring that I was a basket full of negative emotions. I sat down each morning for about 10 days straight and wrote about the emotions of the day. I won't share what I wrote, but I found the writing to be cathartic. I faced each emotion in all its raw pain, learned where it was coming from, and let it go. Embrace the fact that none of us are alone in this struggle. In fact, the very fact that we are in all in this together in many ways has brought us all closer. Many years ago, I was struggling with a personal family problem, and I really felt as though I was the only person who had ever dealt with this problem. The Reverend Frank Clarkson, who was the assistant minister at the North Parish Church at the time, I'll never forget and will always be grateful for his wise and kind words when he pointed out that we all have our own private struggles and not everybody shares them. Embrace the isolation. I've always admired those who are able to live a monastic lifestyle. I've learned on many days too, like a monk, to appreciate being alone. Thomas Merton wrote, what a thing it is to sit absolutely alone. The quiet that comes from spending time in reflection has been incre incredibly inspiring to me. Also, like many monastic communities, I've learned to enjoy the quiet times that come from working alone with my hands, baking bread, chopping vegetables to make pickles, slicing apples for pie, are all great opportunities for a time of working meditation when the house is empty. On the other hand, we are social beings and we need contact with one another. Reach out to friends. I've had friends, old and new, just call or send a text to ask, how are you doing? They've turned into great conversations. We've caught up, we've commiserated, complained, laughed, 
even had a few tears together. Help people. I enjoy time spent volunteering. I suspect in our church community, most of us do. There are so many opportunities to help people who really need help in our communities and even in our families. For example, our daughter and son-in-law, who are both essential workers, were without daycare for a time in the spring. So Pam and I opened up our own private Montessori school for our granddaughter. We cooked, we hiked, gardened, and learned about bugs. It was a lot of work, but it was fun work and a memory to cherish. Our own Jim Bashurin has been transporting food from a food pantry to a distribution point in Dover. Inspired by his leadership, I discovered that it's a pretty easy task and I was glad to lend a hand. When you help someone who needs it, you realize you're doing okay. Get involved. I attended a Black Lives Matter rally in Dover. I felt connected to so many people that shared my values. And for a little bit, I felt 18 again. It took 50 years off my attitude. We have time on our hands. Use it, but don't just use it to be busy. Enjoy taking time for things you've always wanted to do. Learn a new skill or expand on an existing one. I was ignoring my photography work because I couldn't get to the places that I loved to shoot at. One morning I went out and shot an entire roll of film before breakfast. It felt so good to be creative again. Do you play an instrument? It's a great time to learn a new one, or a new tune, or maybe just to compose one. This extra time we've been given is a gift, I think. We have a future to look forward to. We really do. I've decided to make a commitment to that future. I've been told that starting a garden is a great way to show you believe in the future. So I did. It's a tiny little raised bed with a giant cucumber plant and some beans and peppers. But it's ours. And the pickles are delicious. I even started a backyard compost pile. And by the time I get done, our yard will look like the Finthorn Garden. There will someday be a post-COVID world. It's our future and it's our children's future. I want to make it the best future we can have. When I was asked to speak today, I was honored, but at the same time, I was incredibly intimidated. I've seen so many of you deliver some wonderful messages from the pulpit during this period of transition in our community, but I'm so very glad I said yes. As I've sat here on my deck writing this message, I finally faced the monstrous control enthusiast. We've done battle and I, we've arrived at a truce, but I've learned from the struggle and I've learned something else very important about myself and my fellow control enthusiasts. We're warriors. That's what the need for control really is. And we are worried that if we can't fix or change things we want. Mary Oliver said it best. I worried. I worried a lot with the, will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it, and I am, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading, or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing, and I gave it up. I took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. My friends, it's time to stop worrying. 
I found my way through this dark time and in many ways learned to appreciate it. Thank you so much for being part of my community and giving me the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. I hope with all my heart that in all this craziness that you have found ways to find comfort in your life. May you find comfort knowing that we have a strong and loving congregation that is here to support you. May you find comfort in knowing that you can make a difference. And may you find comfort jo just knowing that it's not all up to you. Namaste. Extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. As we finish today, this is my wish to you. Deep peace of the running wave to you. Deep peace of the flowing air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the shining stars to you, and deep peace of the infinite peace to you. Blessed be. Can I just give it to you right now? You can't give it to me. We're not accepting me at church right now, but you can mail it to 73 Court Street. All right, I will do that right away. Excellent. All Thank right. you thanks, so much. Thanks for reminding me. All right. Hey, Greg. What's going on? Have you sent in your uh, annual pledge yet? Um, uh, no. What? 
Um, you're going to pledge, though, of course. I have a pledge form that I can give you. I know it's really important. It's so important. And I'm so, just trying to figure out how to do it. Well, you got a pledge form in the mail, your FCF. You can fill it out. Mail so, it back to the church. Yeah. How, how much should I pledge? I, I, I you know, I'm kind of new to this pledging thing. Well. What's a good guideline? 10%, right? 10% increase over last no, year. No, 10% of my income, right? Oh, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> me too, yeah, right? <laughs> I think that's going to happen. But, so, so what do you, help me think, help me frame this. Well, did you, did you pledge last year? I did. All right, well, you know, you could think about how much you would like to increase your pledge this year. We have a lot going on at the church. We're in the midst of, obviously, the pandemic, and we want to support our staff and all the programming that they're doing, as well as our roof. So, What's an increase would be fabulous. What's wrong with the roof? The roof. We need to replace the roof. That's not cheap. Not at all. All right. Um, can I spread my pledge over, like, on a monthly basis? Yes. And make it easier? And you I can give pledge my per credit month. card or something? Absolutely. And make, make, it, make it so it's invisible and I don't think about Absolutely. it? Absolutely. The, the, the office staff can do that. And it's right on your form. You can put your credit card information, and you can pledge per month. All right, so my goal is I'm going to march home, find my form somewhere. If my cat didn't eat it, I'll fill it in and I'll send it in. So it's the right thing to do. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks Greg. Okay.